Hi, so thank you, Galit, and thanks to Yaniv and, and the team for organizing this amazing meeting. Um, so I'm going to uh, briefly discuss today about, uh, okay, yeah, slide, okay, about learning induced uh, neuroplasticity. Uh, then I'm going to uh, present our framework uh, to relate uh, intersubject variability in connectivity and activity. And last, we'll go back to plasticity and show how we can use the same framework uh, to measure intrasubject variability mainly in the context of learning and memory. So in a, a, as we heard earlier today in the session, a standard plasticity study will include uh, usually uh, some kind of a learning procedure and a scan prior to the, to the training and another scan immediately after it and comparing scans between tasks. And this is just a couple of examples from, from our group uh, showing both functional and structural aspects of neuroplasticity. So on the left, we can see structural modifications after a piano training while passively listening to a piano melody. And we can see mainly increase in activity in motor regions, mainly premotor cortex and the parietal regions. And on the right, we can see modifications, uh, structural modifications or microstructural modifications as measured with diffusion MRI, in this case, a decrease in mean diffusivity, uh, again, following piano training. And uh, the kind of questions we ask ourselves in the lab is whether these two functional or microstructural plasticity are uh, merely a different representation of the same biological phenomena, or do we have two different, uh, uh, two different uh, biological origins to structural or functional plasticity? And I would like to suggest that brain connectivity might be used as the link between function structure and human behavior. Um, so how do we uh, uh, relate connectivity and activity to start with? So a few years ago, together when I was in, uh, in Oxford, we developed a, a framework to take, uh, uh, so maybe I'll get to that uh, in, a, in a second, uh, um, so just prior to that, I'll just show an example. So when people ask to uh, perform uh, the same task, for this example, a learning task. So these are four different uh, participants from Human Connectome Project performing a language task. And we can see that when people do, are doing the same task, we can see variability in their task activity. Obviously, there is an overlap, but different people uh, exhibit different patterns of brain activity. And we can see that uh, the same thing in uh, different cognitive domains as well. And when using group statistics, we usually treat this variability as noise and ask questions about what's similar across participants. Uh, but I find it interesting to also ask why do we see these kind of differences? Is it noise? Is it a biological, physiological noise? Is it in the scanner? Or is it something important and that's something to do with the biology of our participants? And so as I mentioned uh, a minute ago, uh, a few years ago we developed a pipeline that takes scans acquired at rest, connectivity measures, and using machine learning to predict how task maps would look like uh, from scans acquired at rest. So we can take a, a, a model, apply it on resting state functional connectivity measures, and predict task activity in a variety of tasks. So from a single scan, I can get activity maps of different tasks, different cognitive domains. Uh, if I had a, a, a training set that did both, and I can relate to them, and you can see example in here of actual activations on the top row and predicted activation on the bottom and see the overlap between them. Um, and in the last couple of years, we did a lot of methodological work to see how robust it is, and to examine the generalizability of our prediction framework. I don't have time to get into details, but we have several posters uh, outside, so I invite you to come and talk to, our, our, uh, to my students and hear more about that. But I'll just say briefly that we can generalize our prediction of tasks from rest across sites, across uh, uh, vendors, and across population. For instance, we can build a model that is trained on young, healthy adults and then apply the model on 
children from the uh, developmental connectome, uh, for instance. Uh, we also did some work about uh, asking how should we measure the functional connectome, our, the input of our prediction pipeline. And it seems uh, uh, that naturalistic stimuli such as movie watching uh, outperforms the uh, traditional resting state experiment in uh, calculating connectome, at least in the context of predicting task activity. And again, so you can see in the top row the actual brain activation, and you can see predicted activation that came from connectivity measured from rest versus movie watching scans. And movie watching gives us more accurate predictions. Both this is a qualitative example, but we can also quantify that and say that the predictions are better. Um, and another aspect of the generalizability of our models is generalizing across clinical population. And uh, we recently showed that we can build a model relating activity and connectivity on healthy participants and then apply the model on uh, connectivity features of patients diagnosed with schizophrenia and still get accurate uh, activations. So this is just a brief of relating connectivity and activity. Now, if we want to go back to human behavior, uh, uh, to add this to the equation, uh, we first focus on global cognitive uh, assessments of participants. Uh, and when trying to predict uh, cognitive scores out of functional connectivity, we only get, uh, um, we only get relative success. So correlations between actual scores and predicted scores are not that high. We do get significant correlation, but they're not get that high. But if we take functional connectivity measurements and represent them as task-like maps, as predicted task-like maps, we can then use this predicted map to further predict behavior or cognition. And we get much better uh, predictions when doing that. And uh, interestingly, here you can see prediction success both by correlation between actual and predicted scores in, uh, in green or by mean square or between actual and predicted scores in red, we can take a single uh, connectivity scan, whether it is resting state or movie watching, and then predict several tasks out of it and aggregate these tasks in order to improve pred prediction. So we can get better predictions of cognition when using several tasks together. But these are not actual tasks. These are predicted tasks that came from the same score. So the model can give us more information. Um, now let's go back uh, for plasticity. So we know that both our activity, uh, brain activity and brain structure are not fixed. They're in constant change and they're capable of uh, modifications. And this happens not only, but especially in the processes of learning and memory. So we have several uh, training paradigms we use in the lab. I will show a couple of them today. Uh, piano training and uh, sign language learning. Um, so in the first experiment, and you can hear more about it in the poster session outside during breaks, uh, participants were trained in playing uh, Beethoven's for Elise in four different sessions uh, in the course of two weeks. And they were trained at the beginning only on the right hand, then also using their left hand, scanned before and after training. And just this is our, uh, you can see our setup in here. And uh, not surprisingly, we see both functional and structural modifications following learning. So again, in the left, we can see changes in brain activity. They passively listen to the trained uh, sequence and to an untrained sequence before and after training. And we can see increase in activity in motor areas during passive uh, listening to an auditory stimuli. But we can also see modifications in uh, microstructure, in diffusion. So these are the same uh, participants. And you can see in blue uh, a, dec again, a decrease in mean diffusivity. So uh, you can see that the changes are somewhat overlap in their location. Not entirely, but somewhat overlap. What happened here? Oh, it's bad. OK, so now you can see that the changes are overlapping in structure and uh, function. So something happens in this location that is represented both by a decrease in mean diffusivity and an increase in brain activity. Uh, 
Then we looked on uh, functional connectivity. So we can create what we call the seed to voxel connectivity. We can take a seed ROI, in this case, an auditory seed, but we can do the same with a, a motor a seed in a motor region and correlate it across the brain and get these seed to voxel connectivity maps and further uh, correlate them with behavioral score, the amount of success in, uh, in the task. And so these are uh, areas in the seed to voxel connectivity maps that correlate with performance. And again, we can see that there is an overlap between areas that show a correlation between behavior and connectivity and areas that show uh, changes in task activity. So they didn't come from the same scan. So we have task scans and we have rest scans, but the modifications in both scans overlap in, uh, in space. So it gives us uh, maybe a clue about what happened in these regions and the, the, any, uh, we can treat them and we can assume that there is something similar in uh, both of them. Um, so in a second experiment, a similar one, uh, we focused on the language domain rather than the uh, auditory domain. This was done in collaboration with Professor Nama Friedman. And participants took a course in the Israeli sign language. So this is a different modality to study language. We have a problem in Israel in uh, teaching a second language because most of us are bilingual, so it wouldn't be like a new language. And uh, sign language is a completely different modality, so this is a completely new thing for the participants. And this is an eight lesson uh, course spending uh, on about four weeks. This is just an example of our course. It was held via Zoom due to COVID restrictions. So you can see the uh, teacher in here and he teaches them how to speak in sign language. So I don't have much time, so I'll go uh, first about that. And again, when watching uh, uh, short movies about sign language, we see an increase in brain activity. This is before and after, and you can see the uh, statistical maps. Increase in activity in language areas when watching uh, a movie. And again, we also see changes in connectivity, mainly increasing connectivity between uh, language areas, including Broca, Wernicke, and the recently described area 55B. And what I find interesting is we can see an overlap between maps of change in activity and maps of change in C2-voxel connectivity. And they're similar to each other. So just, uh, uh, I will end with this. The last point is the question whether we can take connectivity maps of a given subject and predict the activity out of it and see intra rather than inter-subject variability. So this is now the same subject, not two different subjects, but prior and post learning. And indeed, we managed to predict uh, uh, activity maps from connectivity pre and post learning. So I will just summarize and I would like to suggest that, uh, I'll just briefly say that we can actually predict uh, future uh, scores from scans immediately after the task. But more about that we can discuss on the postal session. So I'll just suggest that variation in connectivity and activity may represent the same neural organization. Uh, that connectivity can predict activity across scanners, site, and population, but also intra-subject variability. And suggest that maybe, and this is a, a, a leap of faith we need to take, but maybe uh, connectivity may, uh, we may think of it as the infrastructure for changes in brain activity uh, and behavior. And we can, you can read more about it in a recently review paper we published about it. And that's it. So I'd just like to thank my collaborators, both in, uh, in uh, Oxford and here in Tel Aviv University and Chiba Medical Center, and to thank the students that run the experiments. And thank you for listening. Yeah, 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 definitely. So changes only in connectivity or activity, both were previously shown to be correlated uh, with behavior. And we do, I didn't have much time to discuss it, but we do see that connectivity features just after learning pe can predict learning outcome even six months later and might serve as kind of a biomarker for successful learning. And we do see it, we see it both with connectivity and activity. 
less with structure. I think that maybe the mean diffusivity is not sensitive enough to catch a behavioral change. We sometimes see that as well. Uh, and the question is how all of them are changing together, I think. Uh, but each one uh, separately, yes, definitely we see correlation with behavior. Thank you.